one from Dolly Parton and Blake Shelton, sharing how much the star has meant to them. What a voice, what a contribution he made, the rhinestone cowboy. We're going to have a lot more from him coming up. But first, a lot of news overnight. That dramatic escalation in tensions with North Korea. Overnight, the regime divide, defied President Trump with a new threat against the U.S. territory of Guam. That came just hours after the president warned that any new threats from North Korea would be met by fire and fury. You know, that blistering rhetoric is a real break from past presidents, and it is being met with concern from Republican and Democratic lawmakers, as a new poll shows that six out of ten Americans are uneasy about President Trump's ability to handle North Korea. Our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz, starts us off from Washington. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, George. The Trump administration has always said a military option with North Korea remains on the table, but as a last resort. But these words from President Trump did not make it sound that way. after the president's dramatic escalation in rhetoric. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury. And one U.S. territory just over 2,000 miles away from North Korea in the crosshairs. Overnight, the small Pacific island of Guam, home to crucial American military bases and more than 7,000 U.S. forces, on alert after North Korea said in a statement its leaders are seriously considering a plan to target the territory with missiles. An attack or threat on Guam is a threat or attack on the United States. This after that stunning warning from President Trump to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un yesterday. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. An overt military threat, all the more alarming, given the latest extraordinary intelligence assessments of North Korea's nuclear capabilities. U.S. analysts now believe the country can produce miniature nuclear warheads, like the one Kim Jong-un posed next to last March, claiming then it was indeed a miniature nuke. Those warheads able to fit inside those ICBM missiles that Kim launched twice last month, the last traveling farther than ever before. This morning, some political leaders, even from the president's own party, concerned that the commander-in-chief's fiery warnings could further incite the already volatile North Korean leader. you got to be sure that you can do what you say you're going to do. The great leaders that I've seen, they don't threaten unless they are ready to act. And, of course, this war of words is all the more worrisome, given that intelligence report on the North's capabilities. George? Yeah, Martha, you mentioned the miniaturization of the nuclear warheads talked about in that report. That's not the only alarming news in there. It is. And intelligence has in the past estimated anywhere from a couple of nuclear weapons to several dozen in North Korea. But this latest report puts the number at 60, the highest we have ever heard and the most definitive, George. Their program accelerating so quickly, Martha Raddatz. Thanks very much. And thank you, George. We're going to talk more about this because joining us now is our contributor, retired Colonel Steve Ganyard. So, Steve, tell us, what's the possible threat here to the U.S.? Well, Robin, what happened yesterday was the U.S. intelligence community, community finally said, we think that they can miniaturize one of these nuclear weapons to put on a rocket that will get all the way to the United States. So take a look at this video here. This is the, this is the uh, evolution of how long these missiles and how far they've been able to reach over time. This is why the North Korean threat has become so much more serious, because they've finally developed those kinds of weapons that can reach all the way to the continental United States. Some people even believe that we can, that he'll even be able to reach somewhere out here, maybe as far as the east coast of the United States. So what are America's options here? Uh, well, Robin, we have what's called a ground-based interceptor, and the ground-based interceptor uh, is a ballistic missile system that uh, is, is uh, able to... Um, is, is able to uh, 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 reach up like a rocket and be able to get in, into space and intercept these North Korean missiles as they come in uh, to, towards the United States. So the whole idea here is we have this developing system. It's a, it's a technological marvel, but it's still only at a 50% rate of success. And so 
We need to continue to develop our defenses to protect the continental United States. Steve, you have also served in the State Department, so you know about the diplomatic side of things. And, and what is your take on the words, the language that President Trump has used with this? Robin, this is really the first kind of fiery rhetoric we've seen out of a U.S. president since really Harry Truman. Uh, and so the president has made the decision to make a direct video appeal to Kim Jong-un to make him understand what the U.S. response will be. Uh, the question now is, does this ramp up? Does the rhetoric continue to ramp up? Or do things begin to calm down? The next few days will be critical. All right, Steve, thank you. Okay, Robin, thanks. Steve mentioned it. That was the kind of rhetoric Harry Truman used after mm -hmm. dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. We're going to talk about it more now with our senior White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Right here, you know, such a bracing moment yesterday to see the president kind of hugging himself as he said these words, but at least parts of the statement tightly scripted. Very much so, George. And, and, and this was a question that was prompted, this was an answer that was prompted by a question from a reporter. He was there to talk about opiates and opioid addiction, and he uh, was asked this question at the end of that. Look, I'm told this was very much a strategic answer by people in the White House, that the president knew that if he was asked about this, that he would have this answer ready to go. And if you watch that tape of the president, it seems as though during parts of it, he looks down and, uh, and is, seems to be reading a little bit. This is, we've seen ramped up rhetoric from the president. President over the, the course the of question North Korea. I have here is, you know, the president already set out a red line back in January where he said uh, he will not, North Korea will not be able to, to create a ballistic missile capable of reaching the United States. Of course, we just heard Steve Ganyard say they have now done that. He said then it wouldn't happen. And particularly the use of the word threat yesterday drawing this response from the president because, of course, the North Koreans came out within hours with a new threat. And drawing criticism from people within his own party. John McCain, you just heard Martha talk about it, saying you've got to be able to back this up if you're going to use language like that. Look, you and I both know in talking with people in this administration, the one thing that is very consistent with them is they say that the president is not going to message what his military actions will be. But we do know that his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, just this weekend said the president had been briefed on military options in North Korea. We know that this is something that he's been following closely. This seems to be a big shift in rhetoric, though, and, and tone coming out of this White House on this topic. And they today. said many times that nothing is off the table. Let's switch topics right now. The special counsel, Robert Mulley, reported in USA Today that there's been some side communication between the president's team and the special counsel. Yeah, essentially what we're told, what this story said was that, uh, that the president's legal team had passed on messages from the president, sort of niceties, uh, expressing appreciation for the job that they're doing. We're told uh, by people in that circle that, uh, that this report seems to be a little bit overblown, that this is nothing more than perfunctory conversation between lawyers, uh, but certainly raising eyebrows. We're told there have been no direct communications directly between the president and Mueller, but, but this report has raised a lot of eyebrows. Yeah, and there has been kind of a gulf between the president and his legal team here. You've seen his lawyers say nice things about Robert Mueller, say they want to cooperate, cooperate with Robert Mueller, but the president complaining a lot about what he says are the special counsel's conflicts. Calling this a witch hunt, not backing down on that. Kellyanne Conway just told you that this weekend. She called it a witch hunt, saying there's no there there in Russia. Uh, but look, the legal team says we are willing to cooperate. We've heard from others in the president's circle uh, who have been called on uh, to possibly testify, saying they will cooperate if they're asked to do so. The president himself, on one thing on this, he is firm. He's calling this a witch hunt and not backing down from that. City of Vega, thanks very much. Robin. Okay, George, we're going to move on now to the other major breaking news. A, a driver plowing into soldiers in Paris, injuring at least six. The search is on right now for the suspect. ABC's James Longman has the latest from London. Good morning, James. Good morning, Robin. A counter-terrorism operation and a manhunt are underway this morning. Paris on high alert after yet another attack on security forces. A man is this morning on the run from police after ramming a car into a group of soldiers in Paris. A dark-coloured BMW was seen waiting near an army barracks in a northwestern suburb of the French capital. It struck just before ATM local, slamming into six soldiers, two of whom we understand have serious injuries, although none is life-threatening. The mayor confirming a deliberate attack, although no motive has yet been established. The soldiers were leaving their post to begin a new shift as part of Operation Sentinelle, which is the ongoing military procedure to guard major sites in Paris. That's because France has been in a state of emergency since the Charlie Hebdo attacks of 2015. This is the sixth attack on French police and the military this year. The hunt is now on for the man and his vehicle. The US Embassy in Paris tweeting a warning to US citizens to avoid the area.
Using a vehicle as a weapon will remind people of other attacks across Europe. Authorities are scouring video surveillance of the area as they try to track down that car. Robin? Hopefully they will soon, James. Thank you. George? Hey, Robin, thanks. The killer of a rookie police officer during a traffic stop in Missouri Sunday has now been captured. Ian McCarthy was arrested last night after he was spotted walking down a nearby highway. He's charged with first-degree murder in the shooting death of Officer Gary Michael, who had pulled over McCarthy for a possible registration violation. Police call the shooting an unprovoked and cowardly attack. Robin? All right, and we're going to turn now to the tropical storm Franklin on the verge of becoming a hurricane moving toward mainland Mexico right now. Rob is in for Ginger, and of course he is tracking its path. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Rob. And now in the Gulf of Mexico, and it is strengthening, but this is what it did yesterday across the Yucatan Peninsula, Puerto Morales, Mexico. Winds over 50 miles an hour there, and a time lapse out of uh, Cancun showing the outer bands getting into that resort area. But now in the Bay of Campeche, it has uh, winds that are approaching hurricane strength, likely to become our first hurricane of the Atlantic season. The waters here are 90 degrees, so it should strengthen easily, getting in between Veracruz and Tampico sometime later on tonight and early tomorrow morning. Uh, flooding rains there with some of those big mounds. Also some flooding rains across the south in the U.S. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Michael? All right, thank you, Rob. And also this morning, people are gearing up for the total solar eclipse. Now just 12 days away, around 12 million Americans are in its path, stretching 70 miles wide and 3,000 miles long from Oregon to South Carolina. And T.J. Holmes is here with how states are preparing for the power surge. Good morning, T.J. Hey, good morning, Trey. More and more Americans are getting their electricity through solar power. So what are you supposed to do when the sun goes away in the middle of a summer day? Well, regulators are working pretty hard right now to make sure your lights don't go out when the light goes out. Small towns are turning into boom towns as millions flock to rural America to catch a glimpse of the rare solar eclipse. I'm really excited about it. When the skies darken across the United States, electric companies will face a massive challenge. How to avoid power disruptions and a post-eclipse surge that could cripple the nation. Grid operators are urgently transporting energy across the country to prepare for the temporary shortfall in solar depleted regions. For several minutes at a time, between the hours of 1135 and 235 Eastern Time, the moon will totally obscure the sun in 14 states. This will strain solar production, similar to the effect of shutting down 15 power plants all at once. In California, where nearly 5 million homes are supplied with solar power, officials are urging residents to unplug and conserve energy use, saying, quote, Let's give our hardworking sun a break. North Carolina, right in the prime path of the eclipse, ranks number two in the country for solar power. We want to make sure we have our power plants in reserve that can take up the slack when the eclipse is happening, but also be able to pull them back when that solar starts to operate again. And get this, another issue has to do with cell phone usage because some of these rural towns, your population is 6,000. It's going to grow to 150,000 people coming to check it out. Your cell phones aren't going to work, so they're actually bringing in cell phone towers, and everybody's going to be trying to do what? Send out a picture, look at the solar eclipse, and you're not going to be able to get those messages. Think, think about that. And also, Literally World Series is going on at this yeah. time. Mm -hmm. They're going to play through it. Yeah, their solution? Turn the lights on. They're just going <laughs> to <play> <laughs> <laughs> really? play through it, hit a switch. It's not going to be a full eclipse where they are. Uh, a pretty significant uh, coverage of the sun, but they're just going to turn the lights on and you are not going to miss play a pitch. Ball. We're going to play, play ball. ball. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, man. You got it, Rebecca. Yeah, All right, Michael. This morning, we're also celebrating the life of Glenn Campbell. Yes, he was a legend. He passed away Tuesday at the age of 81. He was known as a rhinestone cowboy and one of the biggest names in show business. His daughter, Ashley, posting a touching tribute saying she's heartbroken. I owe him everything I am and everything I ever will be. He will be remembered so well and with so much love. Well said. ABC's David Wright has a look at his remarkable life. Good morning, David. Good morning, Robin. He was a country music legend, but there's a lot you might not know about Glenn Campbell. Did you know he acted with John Wayne? That he backed up Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley? He even toured with the Beach Boys. I'm gonna be where the lights are shining on me. With that cleft chin and that clear country tenor. Like a rhinestone cowboy. He was a rhinestone cowboy, destined for stardom. A, horse and a, star rodeo. a ride that lasted 60 years in the music business, including his own TV show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Glenn Campbell. And a few star turns in the movies, cast opposite John Wayne in True Grit. You do that and I'll kill you. 
I wouldn't count too much on being able to shade somebody I didn't know, fella. As a session musician, he backed up Frank Sinatra on Strangers in the Night. Strangers in the Night. And the Beach Boys on Fun, Fun, Fun. That's him playing that famous guitar lick. Lately, Campbell <laughs> suffered publicly That's from right. Alzheimer's disease. What was I saying? I do. I would be right in the middle of a sentence, man. <laughs> a condition he revealed in 2011, recording one last album. The world's been good to me. Released at age 75, toured 151 more shows, saying goodbye. The music lasting longer than his memories. I am a lineman for the county, and I drive the main roads. Oh, that's a great song. But the famous line from it is, I need you more than want you. I need you more than want you, yeah. and I want you for all time. The Wichita lineman is still on the line. His heartbreaking final hit, a tribute to his wife, performed at the Oscars by Tim McGraw. I'm not gonna miss you. He will be missed. Glenn Campbell was 81. Not gonna miss you. He was the son of an Arkansas sharecropper, number seven out of 12 kids, and his dad bought him his first guitar for five bucks out of Sears and Roebuck. In his biggest year, 1968, he outsold the Beatles. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That. that is amazing. And you know, so many country stars are talking about how much he meant to them in this morning. And Glenn Campbell meant so much to Dolly Parton as she sent out this tweet saying, Glenn Campbell was one of the greatest voices of all time. I will always love you, Glenn. He meant so much to so many people. And, and Robert, I know you were a country music DJ. And you know his music so well. I was a DJ in the late 70s and early 80s and really? often got requests for Glenn Campbell. And when we were uh, showing that piece and I, I was singing along. Wichita Lineman. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, it, I, I almost had to play him every hour, but just the, the, the breadth of his, of, his, of his experience and, and you know, the Beatles and, and all that. He, he's just... He's just one of those rare individuals, and the way he handled his illness with such grace and strength. Yeah, yeah that was Amazing beautiful. Grace. Thank you, David. Now let's go back to Rob. We've got a lot more flooding across the south. We do, George. That system that brought all the flooding rain across Texas is slowly sliding east. These are the pictures from yesterday. Up to eight inches falling across parts of Houston. That after the flooding across Austin and San Antonio. Wilmington, North Carolina, also getting about three, four inches in a short period of time yesterday for some flooding there. So here we go. Flood watch is still out for southeast Texas for parts of Mississippi and Alabama as this energy slides to the east. A lot of moisture obviously coming in from the Gulf of Mexico along this frontal boundary. So heavy downpours at times from Jackson to Mont Montgomery to Charleston, especially uh, Charleston could see uh, several inches and in floods there very easily, as you know, locally three or more inches in some of these spots. That's quick check on the national headlines. Time now for your Sunny Cities, brought to you by Sprint. Hi, I'm Paul. People ask why I switched to Sprint. Well, their network reliability is within 1% of the big guys, and they have the best price for unlimited among national carriers. And wait, are you watching this on the awesome iPhone 7? You've got to get iPhone 7 from Sprint, and they'll give you a second one on them. What are you doing? Go switch to Sprint. Who's he talking to? I don't know, but I'd better go to Sprint. Wait. Two iPhone 7s. Love you. Get Sprint Unlimited. And now, get iPhone 7 and get a second iPhone 7 on us. Today will be comfortably mild with the low humidity. If you don't have that something already, find something to do outdoors later today. Just one nice August day. We'll be tracking our rain chance coming back at the end of the work week and a 30% chance too for Saturday and Sunday. So lots of dry hours coming our way for the weekend with the rain occasionally moving through. Best chance of rain is on Monday. 50% chance there could impact part of the morning rush, but more likely it's the evening. Earlier, we heard TJ talking about the eclipse. Of course, you need clear skies for that, so the pressure is going to be on local mm -hmm. forecasters as we get closer to that in a couple of weeks, guys. Huh? It's poor local forecasters. Don't <laughs> put it on that. <laughs> I totally passed the buck. You did. Completely passed the buck. <laughs> wow. And coming up, the radio DJ in that Taylor Swift trial takes the stand testifying about those accusations that he sexually assaulted the superstar. He's going to tell his side, he tells his side of the story. And one of the most famous hotels in the world, the Plaza, hit with a major lawsuit. Six women who worked there coming forward, what they're accusing their co-workers of. Introducing Olay Duo Body Cleanser for the never-before-seen two-sided clean.